Um, what a wonderful morning we've had already. And, uh, you know, as usual, um, uh, I find that uh, God has already started to prepare hearts for a message uh, that he, you know, puts into Roy's uh, heart as well to share with us this morning. And I've already heard um, uh, two or three verses used this morning that I've got prepared in my notes as well. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it, this, this should be interesting. Um, We'll probably need a Bible. There we go. <coughs> told my wife this morning, it's been a while since I've uh, had the opportunity to come up here and speak with you. Um, I told her this morning, I was like, man, I, I'm not nervous at all. You know, I've been, uh, been I've had the, some scripture in, in my mind uh, for a while. I thought we'd preach on uh, several weeks ago. Uh, I've been meditating over that for some time. Of course, I, I try not to do too much into a sermon prep uh, until... Until so God has decided, yes, that's probably the direction we need to go. Spent too many times prepping a sermon, weeks in advance to, to come to the day before, and, and, and the Lord say, no, nope, let's do something else. So, uh, he has uh, sent us to James today, James chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Um, before we get into that, let's just pray, um, and we'll, uh, we'll continue. Father, Lord, just thank you so much for this day. Lord, I thank you for this message uh, that you've laid upon my heart, Father. I pray that you would uh, guide me uh, in every word that I speak. Uh, Father, I just want it to be your truth uh, that we hear here today. Uh, Father, but not just what comes out of my mouth, Father, but to prep the hearts uh, to, and, and the minds to, uh, to what they're about to hear. Uh, Father, there's, there's a lot of um, hard truth, I think, that we might hear today. Father, help us to examine ourselves um, as you have been... Uh, showing us how to do now over the last several weeks. Um, Father, we just love you. We thank you. I uh, just ask that you'd have your way with this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So anyway, I was telling my wife this morning that uh, I'm, not, I'm not nervous at all. This is, uh, is going to be a, an easy deal. You know, I've thought about this long and hard, and um, it, no big deal. So just before I got in the truck to come to church this morning, my palms started to get a little bit sweaty. Like, my goodness, I've had way too much coffee today. <laughs> you know, uh, get to get to church and things are going great here. And all of a sudden I'm standing up here during practice time and I'm just kind of got this little tremble going. So if you hear it in my voice, I, I'm really sorry. Um, but I got this tremble going. But it's just the caffeine, right? Just the caffeine. Double-minded man. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure that we have all heard uh, uh, this phrase. We've read it in Scripture. Um, uh, we'll see that in, in James uh, chapter 4 and verse 8 as we end uh, with that verse. Um, but as we uh, think about that ending verse, being a double-minded man, what, what does that mean? Uh, well, we're going to look at the first eight verses, um, and we're going to really kind of go through this just one verse at a time um, and, and, and try to get a feel for what God's really trying to explain to us here. Um, before we read the Scripture, though, I want to say that... Uh, you know, with, at a show of hands, uh, who out there struggles with sin? Oh, well, it looks like a number of you do. I struggle with sin badly. I have an anger issue sometimes, as my daughter would love to tell you about. <laughs> um, and, and, of course, have uh, been tested this last week. And it's funny how we put a sermon together, you know, and, and, and we, we're getting ready to give a message to everybody else and what normally happens when we do this is that we have a tendency that to, to to be right where God wants us to be to for him to speak to me personally or us whoever's prepping the sermon any of you who have ever delivered a sermon probably knows this and is not real comfortable with it because we go through a time where we have to be stretched and shown what's wrong in our life well <laughs> a real quick story I'll tell you about here is is this last week uh, again, it was chaotic. It was chaotic. My daughter, we, we uh, went and had, uh, had surgery on my daughter's shoulder on Tuesday, which just makes a dad a nervous wreck. You know, it was an orthoscopic surgery. It wasn't horrible. She had a lot of damage there, but it was just crazy. And, and we went through the day just fine. Lots of really cool things happened that day. I'll share with you later. And, um, you know, we, we get home that night. We spent all day in Oklahoma City to get home that night, and my wife says, looks like the power went out. 
And, uh, huh, you know, it's, it's out. This, the, the power always goes out, right? I mean, we, we always have some kind of a power surge someplace. And so it wasn't that big of a deal. We reset the alarm clock, and we, uh, we climb into bed and, and wake up the next morning. Thankfully, I had set my alarm on my phone because the uh, power had gone out again. And, and so you now it's a, not really concerning yet, but it's, it's, I'm wondering about it. We get up. I go into the kitchen to cook myself breakfast like I do every morning, eggs and bacon, every single morning. I throw the bacon on the, on the skittle, and, huh, amen. Uh, I throw it on there, and, and uh, I throw my bacon on the pan, and I turn it to the temperature I always turn it at. And, and my bacon isn't quite cooking. It looks like it might be getting moist. But it wasn't really doing anything else. And so I, I, I play around with the stove, and, and, and the stove won't turn on all the way. It's do, all it's doing is just enough to kind of kind of make the fat on the bacon a little moist. So I get, you know, uh, breakfast that morning with bacon and eggs in the microwave. Mm-hmm, don't do it. <laughs> so um, I get done with that, go to take a shower and prepare to go to work, and, and the lights, now, now, now I caught this power surge. I, I got to experience the power surge, not once, not twice, about three times, and every time that power would come back on, the lights would be dim, and they'd just kind of hover at this half-lit area. This is a problem. Somebody must have hit a telephone pole. So finish up, go to work, get a call from one of the kids, I think it was, we have no power at the house now. There's absolutely no power. So I called the alarm company, and, or the alarm company, hmm. <laughs> called the power company. They come out and test it, and they say everything's good on our side. Oh, now the worry sets in. So here we I am. I had, I had my daughter to uh, contend with and worry about on Tuesday, and here we are right into the very next day, and, and early in the morning I realize I've got a major problem. Uh, we end up taking Tuesday and Wednesday and hand-digging about 70 foot of line in the, in the backyard with by hand. My wife and I are blistered up and, and, and craziness. Well, I am just as, I, I'm at my wit's end. I, I am exhausted. I, I'm tired because we've gotten home late. All of a sudden we have this chaos going on. And one of the very first things that attacks me is my sin. I get angry. I'm so frustrated. How can this be happening to me this week? I don't have time for this. I've got to prep for a sermon. I've, I've, got, I've got my, you know, I want to be on the phone with my daughter worrying about that thing. And, and, and now, obviously, we all know what comes with issues like this, right? Money. It's just money. It just costs money. And, and my poor daughter, she's got things that she's got to get, and she wants to come tell me about the, the items that she needs for her school project, which is just more money, right? This is something that I worry about. So here comes my sin. My sin creeps in, and I start to get a little angry. But God allowed me to suppress that sin after a little bit of time, after I quit trying to do things by myself. So what we're going to see today is we're going to look at we're going to look at sin, that we are completely sinful. Um, we're going to look at God's help there and, and kind of see how that all comes together. So let's look at James. Four. Now that I've spoke probably 30 minutes, everybody's thinking, my goodness, we're never going to get to eat today. I heard laughing. Everybody's thinking it. <laughs> Preached. Here we go. James 4, 1 through 8. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Ouch. Ouch. Man, Scripture just called us sinners right to our face. It says, tells us to purify our hearts and calls us double-minded. Mm, that hurts. 
if we really, if we just read over that, it's one thing. If we really concentrate on what Scripture just told us right there, I don't know that we can really handle that. Verse 1. The conflict within ourselves. What is this? It says that we can conflict within ourselves. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure and war in your members? What does this mean? You know, when we first start reading this verse, we think, well, okay, it's talking to us about fighting amongst one another. If we, if we read over this too quickly, we might consider that to be what, uh, what Scripture is telling us here. But it's not. It's talking about these wars and these, these things that are inside of our mind. You know, if, if, when I started here, I asked if any of you sinned, had, a, had an issue with it. Everybody raises their hand, but yet everybody is here worshiping the Lord this morning. Why? Because we have this war in our minds. If we were left to ourselves, we would never be here this morning. We would never be here. But we have this war in our minds that we, that we just can't quite get a grasp on, and it's so frustrating. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm a good Christian, but yet I sin, and it's so frustrating. Every time I start to do that, my, I, I just get m more angry at myself because I've allowed myself to sin. Romans 7, 21 through 25 says, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Wow. So, Scripture is telling us about this very thing that we're experiencing in our, in our members, in our minds. It tells us very click, quickly. It says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So we have this thing inside of us we, that we, we naturally want to sin. Man, we want to sin. And, and then we almost, in a sense, have this nature inside of us that makes us want to do good. And so we battle with this every day. And it gets so frustrating. Verse 2 talks about lust and the materialism of these things that uh, we desire. It says, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. How many times do we find ourselves in sin, and yet we, we fail to ask for forgiveness? We fail to ask for help when we're sinning. This, we fail to ask God to, to take away these things in, in our minds, to take away the evil thoughts, the, the, the bad thoughts, and the lustful thoughts, and, and the material thoughts that, you know, man, I... I deserve a new boat. Actually, no, that really isn't me. I deserve a new bow. I deserve a new gun, you know? And it's very easy. To, man, I've been a good Christian. I've been a good Christian. Certainly, certainly I deserve these things. So it's very easy for us to naturally start to want material things. 1 John 2, 15 and 16 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. So we have these lustful desires, these materialistic desires that are of the world. We're born into a sinful world we are born naturally sinful and so that's all we know is how to want things of the world it's very difficult for us to want the things of god until you've experienced it, the things of god so god tells us in this in this second verse to ask for the things. He says to ask for them. Who, who was it this morning that used uh, the, the scripture out of Matthew? Talked about ask and you shall receive. Um, he wants us to ask. But it goes right on into chapter 3. He says, but you ask for these things, but you ask amiss. 
you're not asking for the right things. So when we go before the Lord and we ask the Lord to, to um, Lord, I've been a good Christian, right? I would very much like to, uh, to be blessed by something. It, it doesn't matter what. But Matthew 7 says, says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be given or will be open to you. Isn't this a funny uh, bit of scripture? Because it's misused so often. So often we find that this scripture is misused. And it's a horrible thing. Because it causes uh, confusion along with it, everything else. You know, it's like, well, the Bible tells me that I should ask for things. But God never answers my prayer. Why doesn't God ever answer my prayer? You know, I prayed earnestly for my daughter for her shoulder to be healed. I was praying that she would never have to go through surgery. Prayer wasn't answered. Her shoulder was not healed. We found ourselves doing surgery Tuesday morning. Why? God didn't answer my prayer. Was I asking amiss? We would think not. We would think not. Can God do those things? Yes. Yes, He can. He can absolutely do those things. But we don't ask God for the things that God wants to give us. So we're asking amiss. It's kind of a strange thing, and it's very, very difficult to understand, especially when it comes to loved ones and wanting to heal and and wanting ministries to, to perform better and, and be more involved and, and all of these things. So we ask amiss. You know, what happens if we read this verse and just say, man, good deal. We really miss the whole point. We miss the whole point. We kind of treat God as this genie who can who will just give us whatever we want. That's getting kind of extreme, but we have Christians that think that that is the case. And I'll tell you what, Christians, that is not the case. That is not the case. God knows what is beneficial uh, for us. So when we start asking God for, for things, and, and, and like this, for instance, it wasn't beneficial for me. It probably wasn't beneficial for my daughter. It probably wasn't beneficial for anybody involved that she be healed at that time. Still hard to understand. Philippians 4.19 uh, says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. One of my favorite things to pray for when I'm praying for healing over somebody is that his name would be glorified. That no matter what happens, that God's name would be glorified. And here I am this morning. This just clicks in my head sometimes. You know, that you, you kind of go, oh, wow, God, you're awesome. You're awesome. Because his name is being glorified this morning because my daughter wasn't healed. Seems kind of silly. But is it silly? Is it silly? Absolutely not. Verse 4 calls us adulterers and adulteresses. We naturally have this desire, again, for the things of the world. Now, I'm talking to Christians here. I'm not talking to non-believers. So far, we, we haven't hit, hit non-believers yet. This is all for the believer. He calls the believer the ad adulterers because we so naturally want the things of the world and we don't want God, yet we're married to Him. You know? When, when we talk about adulterers and, and adulteresses in our world today, it, it happens so often that uh, a married spouse will go off and, and find, uh, find joy in somebody else that they shouldn't be talking to, shouldn't be in contact with. And it's very easy to call that person an adulterer. It's not so easy to call a brother or a sister in Christ an adulterer. But the second they stop doing God's will and being in, being in tune with God, start accepting and doing the things of the world, they have become an adulterer. Harsh name. Harsh name. Genesis 6, 5 says, 
Uh, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. What does this mean? This means that if we are left to ourselves, we will be continue, continually evil. Now, does this mean that we don't do good as humans? Absolutely not. I know a lot of non-believers who love to go down to uh, downtown Oklahoma City and feed the homeless. They spend time out of their day with people at the hospital. They, they do all of these good things that as Christians, if we looked at them, it's like, boy, that's a good Christian. Is it? Because the non-believers do it too. So what makes us any different than a non-believer when we do the same thing? But this bit of scripture right here um, is before the flood. So we might look at this and go, well, the people before the flood were naturally evil all the time, so God flooded the earth and killed them off and started over. And so we look at that and think, well, you know, maybe we're not evil all the time anymore, but I'll tell you that that is wrong. Genesis 8.21. This is right after the flood. Noah has uh, found land. He is sacrificing animals to God. He is worshiping the Lord. And the Lord does this in verse 21. It says, And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. So we can see that the, uh, the happenings of the flood did not take care of our evil desire. We are naturally evil in our hearts. And it says there from our youth. Mark 7, 21 and 23, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All of these evil things come from within and defile a man. We think, man, that's not a very good person. All of those things, that's not a good person at all. Here's the problem with that, is that as Christians, we still have some of that desire. That is still in us. Think, no, it's not. I'm a saved person. I don't, ha I'm, I don't, I don't have none of that. No, you are just like that. There's, you're divided. We read it over and over in Scripture. I mean, Romans talks about doing the things that we don't want to do. And, and all of those things, I, I'm not going to quote that. <laughs> it, that is a very confusing verse. But it talks about having, wanting, to, wanting to do things that you don't want to do and doing them. And, and it, it's very, very confusing. When, and when we talk about the Scripture that we're in today, being double-minded, and, and having these wars in our mind, if we, if we didn't have this sinful nature, we wouldn't war against ourselves. It would not happen. So why? How, how does, where, where, we, where we go from here? Now, we got this issue of being, of being sinful people. Not good. God has saved us. We're all saved. We're talking about Christians. And yet God gives us this scripture. In verse 5, we see that our God is a jealous God. We read it all through the Old Testament especially. Uh, matter of fact, in the second commandment in Exodus 20, 4 through 5 says, You shall not make for yourselves a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is uh, in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. God says, I know you. I know that you have this evil desire in you. I know that you desire things of the world, but I don't want you to desire them anymore. I want you to desire me. And I want you to desire me because I'm jealous. I am a jealous God. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here, but if we have a jealous God, if we have this God, what, what happens to us when we get jealous of somebody? What do we do naturally? When we get, if, if Brian got that new boat, 
and I really wanted that new boat. I'm going to be kind of jealous of him, you know. And I might do something like this in my sinful nature. Brian might come to my house and say, hey, Scott, you want to go fishing? And I'm going to do, no, I don't want to go with you. You know, I wouldn't tell him that. I'd be absolutely. <laughs> be absolutely. But we might, we might have a tendency to get a little bit angry at somebody that's got something that we don't, that, that we want. So that's one way of looking at jealousy. And I think in a sense, we see the same thing from God. As we'll see here further in Scripture. So everybody now is like, what? Well, verse 6. We move right along here. Verse 6. James quotes Proverbs 3.34. He says, surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. Those who submit to uh, divine wisdom will receive the necessary grace from God to put together the life James talks about in these verses. But we need to, def uh, uh, we need to uh, submit to that divine wisdom. Those who elevate themselves will not have God on their side. Will not have God on their side. I'm thinking, are you, are you kidding me? God is for me. He is for you, but the, the harder you work against him, the more of the world that you want to accept and do and, 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 and all of that, the more God is against you. It, it be, it, as a Christian now, okay, again, I, I've got, I keep emphasizing that because that is the importance here right now. As a Christian, you will find it very, very difficult to do the things of the world and do the things of God. You will find it difficult. It is very, very hard. You cannot do both. Brian cannot come up here and preach every Sunday and go hang out at the bar all during the week. It cannot work. He will find, it, he'll find his life very, very difficult to handle. As will ours. We don't all stand up here and preach. We don't all uh, do these things that stand out on the forefront of God's work. Uh, a lot of us do things in the background, and, uh, which are so much needed. But if we are doing things for the kingdom of God and still going out and being an adulterer or an adulteress and doing the things of the world, we will find difficulty. I think we have probably all experienced that. Again, we're all naturally sinful. So we go out and we, we do things that we know that we shouldn't do, and then we come right back to God, God, I'm sorry about that. And then we go over here and we do the same thing again. We come back and say, God, I'm sorry about that. And we have this natural sin in our lives and we have a tendency to do this. But what we'll find over time is that it becomes very, very difficult in our life. We find emotional issues. We find all kinds of things that uh, all of a sudden start happening and, and they just... It just makes it difficult. It's almost hard to understand. I can tell you of a time in my life I spent about two years running from God. A saved guy. I was a saved man running from God and in, in, a, in a life of sin. And, uh, you know, I still went to church every Sunday. And uh, on my way to church every Sunday, I'm like, man, this is the Sunday that I'm going to get it figured out. This is it. I'd walk right through the front doors of the church and immediately feel like I was going to throw up. Couldn't stand it. What was God doing? Because I kept walking away from God and doing the things of the world, and God was making it very, very difficult. He was, he was showing me something. He was showing me something. <clears throat> and, and getting out and doing the things of the world, He is going to fight you on that because you're His. God will be against your plans uh, because your plans are not His plans. God continually tells you that he's got plans for you to prosper you, right? But if we continually fight against that, he's going to make it very uncomfortable for us. Verse 7. We're getting, we're getting very, very close here. Verse 7. Submission to God and re resist temptation. Uh, we have, kind of have two commands here in this verse. Um, and we're going to look at Ephesians uh, 6, 11 through 18. We've, we've, looked <laughs> we've looked at this bit of Scripture over and over and over again. See, if, we gotta, if we're going to submit to God and we're going to resist temptation, he is, 
excuse me, he has given us the tools that we need to do so. In Ephesians 6, 11 through 18, it says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with the truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith which, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So he gives us these tools to use. This is good stuff. He doesn't, he doesn't save us and say, okay, here's the dividing line. Here's your sinful nature that you're going to pursue, and here's mine. Um, and he doesn't give us a way... He doesn't not give us a way to cross the bridge and to do the things of God. He gives us tools to use, as Ephesians tells us. Because it's a war. Not only is it a war against principalities and those things, but it's a war within ourselves. And we've got to use these tools to fight off our worldly wants. We've got to. We've got to. And he's given those things to us. So now we really don't have much of an excuse. And God's made it that way on purpose. Verse 8 says, Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Again, I'm talking to Christians here, not non-Christians, to Christians. Draw near to God and He'll draw near to you. He will. What you'll find as... Uh, uh, you have first found yourself saved. Is that this will be really, really difficult because you'll really, there, that, that, that part of you that wants to be part of the world is so strong in you and it becomes very difficult. But what you'll find as you start doing the things of God is that they just become easy. They become so easy. And then as we mature, in, in the knowledge of Christ, as we, reach, as we mature in the knowledge of God, as we start reading Scripture and, and hanging out with one another on Wednesday nights and learning from one another, that it's easy. We go out then, after knowing how easy it is, we go out and sin, and we learn how difficult it is. And why we keep doing that is beyond me. It's beyond me. We all do it. And we, we, th we think to ourselves that, man, doing that for God is going to be difficult, and I guarantee you it is not. God will make a way for you in His kingdom. He will do that. He says to cleanse your hands and to purify your hearts in this verse. We see two things. We see forgiveness. Purify your hands. Forgiveness. Because we're saved doesn't mean we don't go before the, before the throne room of God and ask Him to forgive us of our sins. We ought to be doing that on a daily basis. And the other part, uh, this is purify your hearts. This is sanctification. Forgiveness and sanctification. Sanctification, you know, we don't, we don't, uh, we're not um, unborn in Christ and then born in Christ and then, boof, boy, everything's easy. Everything's good from here on out. We spend a lifetime being sanctified maturing and growing and learning you know uh, when we when we start ta uh, learning about God's word you know we we have a tendency to lean this way and then we'll lean this o over here on, on on a certain subject and and we're kind of all over the board I know I have been for years on 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 different things and God what God's doing is he's molding you you know he, he's got your clay in his hands and he's molding you he's sanctifying you he's showing you a little of this and he's showing you a little of that and he's molding you into the person that he wants you to be. We're not all going to have the same thoughts, right? But God has got you exactly where he wants you. He has, he has made you who you are. Yet we still fight against him. 
First John 4.4. 4. I'm almost done. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. I think we heard this today too, didn't we? I was sitting in, in the pew and I thought, oh my gosh. If I can give you anything this morning, let me give you this. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You've got the power. You've got the power living inside of you. All we have to do is lean on Him. Lean on Him in our prayer life. Lean on Him in our reading and, and studying, uh, in our private prayer time, uh, in our fellowship time. We lean on Him. Christian, you are a double-minded man. It's hard. It's hard. We cannot walk away from this church this morning as a Christian and think, whew, that was great. I'm a Christian. I'm saved. I don't have anything to worry about. You are a double-minded man. You're double-minded. All of us are. And we need to be very cautious how we spend our time and where we spend our thoughts. God prepares us for things. I'm going to finish my story from this last week. With another show of hands, does anybody know who Jamie Smith is? Poor Leah, I have, I have like, Jamie Smith, oh yeah! You know? Kids, Jamie Smith, no? Oh wow, well we're going to introduce y'all to Jamie Smith. Um, Jamie Smith is a uh, worship leader um, she was, I believe, born in uh, Chickasha. Uh, she spent a lot of time down in Altus. Uh, she's uh, done some performing over at the Bible Baptist Church, I think, um, or the First Baptist Church. Um, I, I didn't know all this until this week. Um, I've seen her uh, perform at our, our church up in Hera uh, a couple of times and am absolutely amazed at the way this woman can lead people in worship. She is so in tune with God that when she plays, when she performs, because what, what we do is perform, right? That's what we do. But we perform in a way that glorifies God. So <coughs> I've always seen, I've always looked up to her as being what an incredible leader she was. We were on our way uh, to uh, the surgery center Tuesday morning, all excited about being there. And, uh, I walk through the front door, and there's there's a, a, a family back here in the corner, and there's a lady sitting over here, and then we walk in and cause all kinds of chaos, you know. We were hooping and hollering and laughing, carrying on, and, you know, it's a surgery place, right? Why not have some fun? And uh, and I thought to myself, man, she looks really familiar. And uh, I sit down, and I, I'm looking at her, and every time she looks up, you know, you go back to playing on your phone. And, uh, and uh, I'm thinking, man, that's Jamie Smith. Oh, unbelievable. That's, that's got to be Jamie Smith. I text a friend who's sitting over on the other side of my wife, and, and I text her, hey, is this Jamie Smith? Well, she knows another Jamie Smith. She's like, no, that ain't Jamie Smith. Are you stupid? You know? <laughs> and uh, I was like, so I sent her a picture. You know, I, I text her a picture of Jamie Smith, and she goes, hm, might be, because she's also experienced uh, and been in, been in uh, some worship uh, experiences with her. <coughs> and uh, she got a phone call, and she answered the phone, and she's got one of the most distinct voices I've ever heard in my life. Very deep, kind of rough, and uh, kind of like, Jamie Smith. It's way cool. It's kind of exciting for me because I've always looked up to her as being uh, just some, a, a role model, you know, in, in, in my life and, and growing as, as a worship leader. This is all brand new to us, you know, and, and so if I ever wanted to be like another worship leader, I've always wanted to be like her. And uh, anyway, we got taken out into another waiting room and, and, and left her. And I was like, oh, that, you know, we're still talking about it and, and, and texting and what have you. And then she comes in to that waiting room as, as well because um, she had a family member there. And uh, uh, her dad was, was having surgery that day. And she picks up the phone to call back to the nurse's station. And she said, yeah, this is Jamie. You know, and I, ha, I knew it. I knew it. And she gets off the phone and I said, uh, Jamie Smith? She said, yes, and, and of course we had a little, you know, uh, talk. I said, yeah, we've been talking about you for like the last hour and a half over text message. 
<laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, it was, it was kind of a funny thing. But um, what God does, and my whole point about all of this is I didn't realize it at the time, but I realized God was preparing me for one rough week. He was preparing me for a, for a week that was just one of those weeks. Had the opportunity to, uh, to pray with her um, and, and, and had the opportunity to tell her what, what she means to me and what a role model she had been in my life. And, and I'll tell you right now, to bless somebody like that, you should have seen her. She is just as incredible off the stage as she is on. What an incredibly godly woman. Uh, unbelievable. So, of course, that made my day, or week, or it's this Sunday. I'm still enjoying the encounter. But God prepares us for things if we will open up our hearts and our minds to those things. Um, I wish I would have realized what God was doing then. Because obviously I didn't know I was going to go home the very next day, be out in the backyard with a sharpshooter digging a trench, you know, in, in 105 degrees. It was, it was miserable and, and frustrating. Um, but all of a sudden, I notice, thinking back on it now, I, I notice myself starting to, it is what it is. And I started to have this, this, this is what it is attitude about just about everything. Because it wasn't just, I mean, there was, there was all kinds of things going on there. But it just is what it is. And, and God had prepared me for that. Which is incredible. So we need to know uh, that... Uh, and we're sinners. We're sinners. And that we fight this constant battle. But we don't find it alone. We don't fight it alone. We've got God living in us because he who is in us is stronger than he who is in the world. Christians. Non-Christians. There's probably several of you out there that have listened to this and, and have all of a sudden started to experience some of the hardship of the world. And you're not real sure why. You're listening to this because God has wanted you to hear something today. I, there's no coincidences anywhere. Everything is planned. And all of a sudden you realize that uh, uh, you, you're thinking, you're hearing me talk about sin and how difficult it is for the Christian and how God tells us we're these adulterers and we're, we're no good people. And, you're, and you're, you're just confused about how all of that is. And, and let me tell you that, that you cannot do it on your own. As a matter of fact, if you're here, he's already started to work in your heart. He's already started to work. And what he's wanting you to do now is to start doing the things of God. He's already prepared you. He's prepared you for today. And he will prepare you for things to come. So we go away. Just think about that. What are, we, what are we doing in our lives that we can take out? And what are we doing in our lives, not doing in our lives that we can put in? Put in more of God. Quit uh, being a double-minded man. We can quit being double-minded. But we need God's help. And we need to focus on him more than the world. We need to take, matter of fact, he says... He who's friend of the world is an enemy of God. So those things that are in the world, we need to let go. We've got to let them go. Father, Lord, I just thank you uh, for this scripture. I thank you for these, Lord, that have come here this morning to hear a word that you uh, wanted them to hear. I pray, Lord, that uh, as we go away from here, that uh, we start to let go of the things of the world. Help us to see more of you. Encourage us, Lord, by your spirit to dig deep into your word. Father, to carry it around with us. And Father, to put on this armor of God that's this deep and to use these tools that you've given us to use. Help us to be a light in the world, in this dark place. Father, I'm just so thankful that you have taken us out of that dark world. That you have chose us, that doesn't make sense. That you, that you have chose us before the foundations of the world to be married to you. Father, help us to not be the adulterous people 
that we so naturally want to be. Be with us all today, Lord. Help us to make up those minds. Help us to not be double-minded, Father. We just love you and thank you in Jesus' name.